Thank you for having me. It's 3 a.m. and my daughter, who's three at the time, is wailing again. She's having the dream. It's 3 a.m. and she's having that dream again. This is now a recurring nightmare. She has this nightmare about a hippo and she's had it for weeks on end. Every couple of nights I'd have to attend to her, her face sopping wet with tears, her pillow soaked, and it's about a hippo. And just last year when she turned 12, she finally told me that this hippo actually had a monocle and a top hat. And now it started to make a little bit of sense to me because it's true that really anything that you put a monocle on a top hat on is gonna look a little creepy, like, you know, like these guys. You know, even if you took one of our trusted emergency medicine educators, like this guy, and you put on a mon <laughs> instant villain, instant villain. But I think as we get more sophisticated, as we get older, and in emergency medicine in particular, we have our own set of nightmares, like the can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, or missing that rare diagnosis like this aortic dissection, or probably most of ours worst nightmare, getting that guy with the tracksuit to give you that stuffed envelope that nobody wants to get. I'm gonna share with you two cases that I've had over the past year that were infectious disease nightmares that definitely caused me a few sleepless nights. Like most of you, I'm a community emergency medicine provider. I work in a busy hospital. I manage a high volume of patients, and I have a lot, but not an unlimited access to resources. And one of the joys of my work is that every day is different. I never know what I'm gonna get when I walk in to that hospital door. So let's take door number one. Our first patient, he's a 72-year-old retired dermatologist and he comes in complaining of a fever that he's had for the past three days. Tmax was 39.8. He's had some diffuse myalgias and he vomited once. And I ask him, you know, so have you been anywhere? And he tells me, you know, I was. I got back from Haiti five days ago. I was visiting family, but don't worry about it. It was the dry season. Uh, so I don't think I have malaria and it's probably not dengue. So you get alarm bells go off, right? Because I remember, you know, I, I went to U of T, I think a lot of people did. You know, our esteemed tropical disease specialist, Jay Keystone, always told us that fever in the returning traveler is malaria until proven otherwise. So all these alarm bells are going off. But the guy actually looks pretty good, kind of like gold. He's got a bit of a temperature, but the rest of his vital signs are normal. And there's really not much else to find, like his head and neck exam is normal, his heart sounds are normal, his neck is supple, he doesn't have a rash, he looks great. So I did what probably most of you would do. I think we order a bunch of labs because that's what we do as emergency medicine doctors. And what I get back isn't really very exciting. His thick and thin smear are negative. His CBC shows just marginally low platelets. I send off dengue serology, but it's gonna take a few days to come back. And so, you know, he feels reassured, I feel mostly reassured, and I let him go out the door, right? But I tell him, come back in 12 hours, get your malaria rechecked, I want to make sure you don't have malaria, and sure enough, he comes back the next day, he has another malaria screen, it's negative. My colleague actually tells him to come back again that evening for a third malaria screen, it's negative. And so he gets discharged, still intermittently febrile, but told to follow up with his family doctor, which he does. Uh, he sees his family doctor the next day and he defervesces, but is still feeling pretty lousy. And so he gets sent back to the ED for reassessment. And I'm really glad he did. Because this is what he looked like now. He's not quite as golden as he was a couple of days ago. Right? He's a little tachycardic. His pulse pressure is a little narrow. His hemoglobin's gone up, but his platelets have gone down. So he gets admitted, and his diagnosis? Severe dengue fever. 
right? Severe dengue fever. So I thought I knew the diagnosis, but I didn't realize how sick this guy was going to get. Because only about 2 to 5% of patients with dengue will get severe dengue. We can kind of get away with not making this diagnosis most of the time, like many things in emergency medicine. Only a couple percent of the patients are actually going to benefit from interventions. But the ones that do benefit a lot. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, Summer, why are you bothering me with this rare tropical disease? We're never going to see this. But our patients travel. In fact, if you look at the most common place we travel, most of us still go to America, right? The land of small hands and big mouths. Uh, but the rest of us do go to other places that are dengue endemic. If you look at this list, seven of the top 15 destinations that Canadians go are dengue endemic. And even in America, there is dengue in Hawaii, southern Florida, and southern Texas, as well as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Right? So your patients are going to be going there. And in fact, there were 300 documented cases of dengue in Canada, which is probably a gross underrepresentation of what we're actually seeing, because it probably doesn't get diagnosed most of the time. It's the leading cause of febrile illness in patients returning from the Caribbean and South America. And the problem is that to diagnose it, the blood tests take a few days, right? So it's got to be a presumptive and clinical diagnosis. How are you going to diagnose it? Well, they have to be febrile. You have to rule out malaria, because it's way more lethal than this most of the time. But they just need to have a fever plus two of these things. So our patient had vomiting and myalgias. But if they've got rash, warning signs, which we'll discuss, leukopenia, or a positive tourniquet test, where you apply a blood pressure cuff and blow it up to the median between their systolic and diastolic blood pressures and look for petechiae, they're going to have dengue fever. Warning signs, you're going to figure it out. You've got severe abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, mucosal bleeding, liver enlargement, ascites or pleural effusions, delirium, or like our patient, an increasing hematocrit with a decreasing platelet count. And the key, the key to dengue and figuring out who's going to be sick is actually waiting until they defervesce because you don't know the severity of dengue fever until the fever is gone. That's when they enter the, the, the critical stage. Right? That's when their capillaries start leaking. And only about 2 to 5% will get that. So these patients need serial daily reassessments until they've defervesced and you know how sick they actually are. The ones without warning signs can have this done as an outpatient. They don't need to stay in hospital because most of them don't get sick. The ones with warning signs or who have comorbid illness need to stay in. Uh, that's pretty easy. And what you do really does matter here because the mortality from severe dengue has dropped from 20% to 1% with simple supportive treatment, just judicious fluid management. What you do really does matter here. So dengue is a clinical diagnosis, serial daily reassessments, even in the well patients. Our patient did fine. He actually got admitted, had a little bit of ascites, hypotension, and then got better and discharged four days later. My next nightmare starts again in a waiting room like this, which I think to most of our consultants is a nightmare, but to us is just kind of like an honest day's work, right? This patient was a 26-year-old woman. She was visiting from the UK. She'd had a fever for the past three days, and actually she got it just as she was leaving from the UK. She had some vomiting and diarrhea for a couple of days even before that, and some mild rhinorrhea, cough. And at the end of the interview, she tells me she's just got a little rash over her chest. There's not really much to find when you examine her. Her vital signs are pretty normal. She has a little bit of tonsillar erythema. She has a very fine maculopapular rash. So again, I send off a few labs. And these labs are a little less normal. She's got a little bit of a transaminitis. Her platelets are a little bit low. But the rest looks pretty good. And so she gets a liter of ringers and a couple of Tylenols. And she's feeling much better. She doesn't really want to stay in the hospital. She doesn't have coverage. Uh, and so I discharge her with some close outpatient follow-up in 48 hours. And she comes back. She's feeling worse. Her rash has gotten worse. Her LFTs have gone up. 
So she gets admitted. And she sees ID who says that probably she's got a nonspecific viral exanthem, maybe a drug reaction. But then she's diagnosed with measles. And this one blew me away. I got that call from our occupational health asking me if I was immune. And I was like, why are you asking? Well, that patient you saw a couple of days had measles. Completely off my radar. Right? But it should be on our radar. Because even though this is fairly rare at this point, we've lost endemic measles in Canada. It's so contagious and such a nightmare when we don't contain it. Nine out of 10 people who are exposed to measles and are susceptible will get measles if they come into contact with it. And that virus will stay aerosolized in the air when a measles patient walks into a room for two hours. It's crazy contagious. Right? And remember my patient, Two busy airport terminals, a plane, an ED waiting room, DI, the ward, before anyone clued into what she had. This is our recurring nightmare in North America. We thought we got rid of it when we started immunizing and the cases started disappearing. But I think this allowed our society to develop a little bit of amnesia as to how bad this is. And it kind of allowed us to start taking really bad advice from you know, bunnies and discredited quacks, right? And so our vaccination rates have fallen over the past two decades, and we need a 95% immunization rate for herd immunity. But we're not there. This is a map of Toronto primary schools. The white squares are primary schools with 95% immunity. The red squares are below 95%. Like, this is horrifying to me. Nobody should be getting measles in Canada, right? The lowest ones are below 50%, below 70% immunity. You can only imagine if one kid with measles walks into one of these schools, right? And I don't want to be Toronto-centric. Here's Vancouver. The red spot, the, sorry, the green spots are the only ones that actually reach 95% immunity. So it's important for us to make this diagnosis. This isn't just a public health concern. It's up to us to stop this cascade because there can easily be a huge epidemic. Our immunization rates are not there. And I told you about societal amnesia, but I think there's also a bit of medical practitioner amnesia. This is off our radar. It's rare, we rarely see it. And most of us haven't had it at this, at this point. Most of us have been immunized. And so we need to remember to make this diagnosis, which is fairly straightforward most of the time, right? We can remember the three C's that we learned in medical school, conjunctivitis, coryza, cough, fever, and a rash that spreads from your head down typically. But there's one more key point if you're diagnosing this in North America. If there's no epidemic, measles is imported. Right? Measles is on your differential for fever in the returning traveler, just like malaria and dengue. Except they're not returning from anywhere exotic. They can be returning from Europe. If you look, Italy, Romania, Ukraine had over 5,000 cases last year. Right? Germany, almost 1,000 cases. These patients could be coming from anywhere, like the UK. So to summarize, we have all have our fair share of nightmares. I think it's up to us to be suspicious and try to turn all these nightmares into potential fairy tale endings. It's just up to your clinical suspicion to make these diagnoses in these two rare cases. Our patients and our communities will benefit immensely from your care. Thank you. <laughs>